Jonathan Lacoste is the general partner at Space.VC, a venture capitalist firm that is investing in the space industry. They're investing in space company all across the space industry from very hardware intensive companies like Loft Orbital to what we'll talk a little bit more about companies like Pixel in the Earth observation industry. To give a bit of context, Pixel is a company based in India who's trying to develop a constellation of hyperspectral small satellites, and they recently raised 25 million in Series A at the time of recording. During the conversation, we talk about how Jonathan picks some of the companies they invest in, and we take the example of why they decided to invest in Pixel. Before being an investor, Jonathan started Jebit, a company that was focused on changing interactive advertisement online. Basically what they were doing is taking what users behavior was online and trying to sell that to a bunch of businesses that didn't really know necessarily what to do with it. While at first that might not sound very relevant to the space industry, we actually talk about how that experience has helped Jonathan in today's industry of earth observation where those problems sound quite familiar. We go over why Jonathan decided to go in the space industry having no experience in it before and why he chose after having founded a company and had a very successful exit with Jebit decided to go towards investing rather than starting a new company. I think I didn't really expect to talk about but it was really fun. At the end of the episode we also talk about why Jonathan is a big fan of the board game Settlers of Catan and why that's actually quite relevant. A bit of housekeeping, the sponsors keep the show going uh, so a big thank you to them and here's a little bit about them. This episode is sponsored by the Radiant Earth Foundation. They're behind some projects like the Spatial Temporal Asset Catalog, or STACK for short, which is changing how we index and access satellite imagery. Right now you can apply for the 2022 Radiant ML Hub Impact Awards. If you're doing anything related to agriculture in Africa, you can head to the link below and apply for a $5,000 cash prize. The deadline is until June 30th, by the way. This episode is also sponsored by Element84, they're a software engineering company specialized in big earth data for geospatial applications. One of the examples of the things they've worked on is bringing the Sentinel-2 imagery onto the Amazon Web Service Open Data Access, so now anybody can access it. I've actually had Dan Pallon, their CEO, on the podcast, and you can find that at episode 16. I'll have links to all of that in the show notes. With all of that said, here's my conversation with Jonathan Lacoste. All right. Hi, Jonathan. Um, thanks a lot for coming on the podcast. I'm pretty excited to, to talk with you. Um, I like asking the same question uh, every single time when I start the, the podcast. I like asking people how they would describe themselves. And so I'm quite curious to know how would you describe yourself? Well, it's great to be on. Thanks for having me. Um, I'd say I'm intellectually curious, relentlessly focused. Um, I love building and I'm a sucker for all things Settlers of Catan and F1 and uh, <laughs> sports. So I do enjoy uh, a good number of hobbies outside of work, too. Would you, like, what What makes you, like, can, can we expand a little bit on those, like, different things? Like, what makes you curious? What makes you focused? And we'll get to, like, Settlers of Catan and F1 later. <laughs> Fair enough. I feel like for most people, a lot of how our lives have been shaped, have been based on the people around us, and especially early on in our childhood, our parents and adults around us. And so I'm the oldest of three siblings, um, oldest grandchild, um, much older, five or six years older than kind of all the other cousins. Um, and so for me, my childhood was surrounded by adults in the Midwest in Ohio. And um, very early on, you know, traveled the, the world in Europe with my parents. Um, my mom had me when she was 21 years old. And so, you know, my childhood and the stories of my childhood were very much shaped by um, this curiosity of traveling and exploring the world and understanding the world around us. And I feel like that has just continued on through my education and, and as I grew up as well. I was just going to say, as it relates to the focus front, you know, probably like a lot of former athletes, I played very competitive ice hockey growing up. And my dad, who is French Canadian, um, played ice hockey uh, professionally in Sweden for a little bit before he came and coached here division one in the U S and probably like most former athletes who also had the coach father dynamic with their parents, you know, there was a very focused, relentless effort about our training and our development and 
kind of the expression that was always grilled in, in the back of my mind is there's someone on the other side of the world that's training and working harder than you. You just may not see it. <laughs> and so that's almost become like a mantra for me in all aspects of life, right? Um, uh, you know, whether that's work or school or, or sports or – and so that probably is a little bit of where that focus and, and effort comes from. I, I, I want to come back to some of those aspects. Um, maybe let, let, let's go a little bit over um, – how you started and like where you are right now. I think I'd like to um, go if you could explain a little bit um, your process going through building a jet of it, like what that was like, how that started, and yeah, we can move on from there. Jebit, I would say, is one of the most interesting startup stories and journeys that I've certainly been a part of and that I've heard of, partially because. It has elements that are romanticized as part of the startup experience, but it also okay. was a very difficult trying journey that I think represents the reality for a lot of startup founders, which is why I have such deep empathy for founders and CEOs. So after I grew up in Ohio, I moved to Boston and went to school. I started at Boston College, and before the first day of school even started, um, I had met some friends and classmates, which eventually became my co-founders in the company. And over the first three semesters of school, we were building Jebit, which at the time was a market research platform for college students for large enterprise brands. And none of us had any experience, right? One was one of my co-founders was a computer science major, one was a biology major, and I was, I think, in accounting or finance in the business school. So we effectively had no experience. But we had a lot of energy, we had a vision, and what we did correctly do is we picked up on a problem in the industry and we were attacking it and trying to solve it in different ways. So fast forward, you know, after three semesters of, of attempting to build this, we'd actually raised about a half a million dollars in um, angel financing from strategic angel investors in Boston and had been accepted into Techstars on our third attempt. Uh, this was when Techstars had like two locations, you know, Boulder, right. Colorado, and Boston, I think, and, and maybe New York. And so fast forward um, over a very long story, and we can jump more into it if, it, if it's of interest, we basically spent the next 10 years pivoting a few times, figuring out what our product market fit is, scaling the business and, and you know trying to build a company of impact. We raised $95 million in venture capital and private equity along the way. We ended up selling the company last year, a majority stake for well into nine figures, hundreds of millions of dollars. So on one hand, you know we dropped out of college. I, I was a sophomore, I was 19 years old. We raised close to 100 million in venture. We sold the company for a lot of money. So all of those elements were really positive, but it was a very long, tough decade. My co-founder's father committed suicide halfway through it. There were several deaths that really, you know, um, took everything for us to stay focused and, and kind of continue building periods of time where we were off salary and only a month left of capital in the bank. So I share those because for so many startup journeys, you see just the headline at the beginning yeah. and the end, and you think it's up and to the right. And it couldn't be farther from the case. And so, um, again, that's why being on the venture side now, I have a lot of empathy uh, for, for founders as they build. Yeah, that's th thanks a lot for like talking about that as well. That's one of the things I'm interested in as well is understanding like how people get to where they are. And it's not, especially if you're working on something that's like a decade long, it's probably not sunshines and rainbows every single day. Um, so I'd like to start back at the beginning. You said one of the things you had going for you is, is you had found a problem that was worth solving. Like, um, um, I forgot how you phrase it. Like, you, you picked up something in the industry, uh, a problem in the industry. Can you go a little bit more in detail as to, like, what that problem was and how you picked that problem as a thing to solve? This is one of the most important decisions I think founders face when they're starting companies is, do you build a company around a cool idea or a product and then go search for problems to solve? Or do you have a unique insight into a problem in the industry and you are thinking about the best way to solve it? And oftentimes I see founders and startups maybe start backwards from that. So in our instance, it won't be super uh, relevant to your space audience on day one, but it actually evolves to something quite relevant to Earth observation remote sensing over time. Yeah, Our problem that we were solving was basically this idea of, of interactive advertising. This is 2011, 2012 for context. YouTube videos are playing. There's a 30-second pre-roll ad. And there was no skip button. 
And what we were kind of flabbergasted by as college students is that brands were paying millions of dollars to put advertising in front of us, and we were effectively checking our phones or opening up a new tab and going to Facebook. It was it was a total attention um, arbitrage mismatch, and they were still paying, uh, like the economics were paying uh, for that. And so being naive, I think one of the best things about being naive sometimes is that we went in full force and tried to change the entire pricing model of the industry. We came up with this new approach. We thought, how could we gamify and make advertising more interactive? And of course, we had like small success along the way. But as we got further into it, we realized what was wrong with our approach. But as a part of that, we always kept the mission and the vision of the company focused on solving the most important problems for customers. And how that evolved over time was we realized that in enterprise in the b2b enterprise ecosystem there was this vast acceleration of enterprise companies being able to collect and use our online information and data our web browsing behavior our transaction history location data from our mobile phone um, the amount of information that was being collected is actually quite crazy but a lot of the most important information that enterprises wanted they weren't easily able to collect because that information is collected through conversations like you and i are having here yeah. So the crux of the company eventually became how do we create an enterprise software platform that helps collect this new type of really valuable data that enterprises want, but they don't have at scale? How do we educate the industry on the importance of this data? How do we opera- operationalize this data through the enterprise tech stack? And how do we leverage analytics and insights and action to actually drive business results and outcome? And that's what's so exciting and kind of interesting about the parallel that you probably are thinking of in yeah, EO yeah, yeah. and remote sensing today in the space industry. But, but that, that was our world. Our world was collecting and leveraging this data for Salesforce and Amazon and Snap and Facebook and Google and, uh, you know, the enterprise tech stack that those larger companies leverage on a day-to-day basis. And did you, you, you mentioned like you went on, on what, you, what you mentioned was like a naive approach at first. Do you feel like that was still right? Like, or did you feel like you just completely pivoted in the way that you thought about it and trying to solve the problem? And like, maybe that was just a good to kickstart it, but then like, it, it was not a good way of seeing it. I would say the answer is somewhere in between. So the, the idea that I love is we had a company value called Shoshin. It's this Japanese expression that basically means beginner's mind. Regardless of how experienced or inexperienced you are in a certain field, I love when people come to a problem with a beginner's mind. And so that aspect was very good. And so if you're a founder or you're an early stage employee, even if you've been in you know, the remote sensing industry for two decades and you have a ton of experience, how can you approach this as if this was your first day with a new, fresh perspective? So that part I always commend and I think is really valuable. The part that is more difficult is when you're trying to launch a company in an industry in which you have no yeah. experience, there's a sharp learning curve. So what I would have done is earlier on in our startup journey, I would have spent six to nine months just grabbing coffee meetings with potential customers that were experiencing that problem and just asking them questions. I would have written a hundred pages of notes, understanding intimately what problem they have, when do they have it, what other technologies are they trying to use to solve that problem. And then once I had a world-class understanding of that, I would build a company and a product around that. And I oftentimes think that founders jump into build mode a little too quickly because they may have that personal experience, which may be 100% verified. But if you have that experience while you're working at one large bureaucratic company or prime, that may not be the same experience that others have in other settings. So just really making sure you have a lot of those conversations, I find is really helpful before day one even hits. Right. That's actually really interesting because I, I feel like I have a more engineering background, like I'm a data scientist. And so like building stuff is the thing I do. And it does feel like, okay, just build the thing. And then, you know, you kind of figure it out. Like, of course, it's going to solve the problem. But what you're saying is like, no, 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 that's like much further down the road. It's like, at first you get this hunch that there is a problem here. And then it's like, I like how you phrased it as like becoming a world-class uh, like getting a world-class understanding of that problem like before you even write like any line of code or you know build anything how do you then keep that beginner's mindset once you become that world-class you, you get that world-class understanding of a problem and you work in something for for many years how do you um entertain that beginner's mindset 
I think one of the benefits of your and my generation and the world that we live in now is things change so rapidly and so consistently. You can't afford to sit on your laurels of this is the way I've always yeah. done it and, and, and have the expectation reasonably that it won't change. That might have been the case 50 years ago, but just the pace of innovation and how quickly certain sectors are changing, that's nearly impossible. So I think part of it is for space in the environment we're in. The other part, though, is for founders to really make sure they surround themselves with an extremely talented team in, in, that has strengths in other areas where the founder or founders are not strong. And this is the most important part, not being afraid to debate within themselves in a, in a fair and respectful manner. Oftentimes, I find the dynamics of founding teams and management teams is actually one of the most important indicators of success is how openly, frequently, and willingly are they able to debate and have honest intellectual conversations about the direction of the company, the product roadmap, the positioning and branding. Teams that are afraid of conflict a lot of the times end up having a lot of issues they're not able to resolve internally. So how do you kind of continue that Shoshin beginner's mindset? Surround yourself with a really talented team that's always forcing you to go back to first principles and think about, is this the best way to be building this product or company? And I think that's really important regardless of if you're one employee and one founder on day one or if you're worth a couple billion dollars and you're about to IPO. That's super important to hold throughout the journey. There's a lot of things I want to unpack a little bit here. Um, like I like the idea of, of like getting back to, to, to first principles. And I think I want to get back to that as we go a little bit further in, in the conversation. Um, but before we go there, um, can you help me understand a little bit more about like the journey that you took to get to starting Space VC? Um, so you built this company and you're there for, um, I think you said 10 years, uh, you sold the comp you sell the company. Um, what happens after that? Um, like you probably have a big lump of money on your hands. What's the, like, and you just, I, I don't know if we mentioned it, but you dropped out of college. Um, you build this company, you have, you, you sell it, you have like a large amount of experience in, in, in building a company. How do you think about like what the next step is? I love the question because it took me months of wrangling and reflecting and thinking by myself and listening to podcasts to figure out <laughs> what that next step was. And I think there's always that pressure whenever you've had like, hopefully what many will consider to be a successful mm. first step of your career to think and follow up, like, what am I going to do next? For me, I found that at the end of the day, what motivated me most was impact. And one of the things I felt I was lacking the most from my pr previous journey in building a company in enterprise B2B data tech was a direct correlation with impact. You know, our company was powering some of the world's largest websites and we were helping you know, companies and consumers in, in a lot of different ways. But is that something that when I really reflected on it, I felt was going to be noted in the history books or I could talk to my grandkids about and feel like I made the world a better place? And so I was almost, um, you know, overly focused as a next part of my journey and making sure that I was more directly helping build an ecosystem in towards a brighter future in an area that I was just innately passionate about. Because if I learned anything from building startups, it was that the journey is hard and you can't expect it to be quick or easy and do it for anything other than just a deep love of what you're doing. And so to get to your question, I'd always loved space from afar, but I had never given myself the opportunity to really learn about the ecosystem. And so I spent six months just doing Zoom calls. This is in the middle of the pandemic, right when we, we, we got started, just talking to experts. Some were CEOs and founders, other were other investors, some were folks at NASA or other agencies. And I just wanted to learn. And I was a sponge and I asked a lot of questions. And I was pleasantly surprised that my experience was actually maybe a little bit more relevant than I had given myself credit for. I thought I was okay. going to be a total outsider. And to a certain extent, I am and I have that different perspective. But it was slightly more relevant than I realized. So a combination of wanting to help other founders, and, and, and I'm being attracted to folks with that energy on, in entrepreneurial spirit, having the ability to maybe build something from scratch myself and building a venture capital fund was really interesting. But most importantly, doing it in an area where I felt like if we were successful, 
we could make a really big impact on not only our generation, but generations to come. That all encompassing was really motivating for me at this point in my life at, you know, 28 years old. How did you measure like what had the biggest impact? What was the process for you that, that was like, this has a bigger impact than the thing I was doing for. And, and I'm guessing you probably have like a mid max approach where you're thinking like, how do I maximize the, the impact that I have? I didn't necessarily try to quantitate impact, but I looked at it more from this standpoint. In 300 years, when students of the future are learning about the early 2000s and the 2020s and, and this, these decades, right? Outside of COVID and a bunch of the other nonsense that they're going to be <laughs> learning about, what are they going to look back on and say, like, these were the two or three major accelerative in industries or moments that transforms the future, right? Like, just like you and I look back now and take a look at the early dot-com internet era or the original space era in the 1960s um, or, you know, H Henry Ford and the Model T, right, and the Wright brothers in the plane, right? Like, there are these seminal moments in history. And so I tried to be really reflective on that. And there were a lot of options, right? There's some really interesting um, innovation and research happening in personalized medicine and human genomics. There's really interesting innovation happening in climate change tech in energy transformation. Uh, for me though, I wanted to combine something that I felt like I was maybe a little bit more passionate about, something that I felt had a really good opportunity to be helpful in, and that my skill set was actually translatable. Because you can be passionate as you want about biotech yeah. and personalized medicine, but for me that was a bigger translation and leap, and I never want to be the person in the room that is just there for the sake of it. I want to be able to contribute and be helpful. And so that's why for me, kind of this intersection of at Space VC, we invest in infrastructure and software and climate oriented companies that are in the space domain. That for me was a really interesting way to approach it. Right. And you mentioned that you had multiple skill sets. Like, like you're, as you were having these conversations, you realized that those conversations, that the skills that you had built um, were more applicable than you thought. Like, can you give a, some examples maybe of when you had those um, realizations and, and what kind of skills are we talking about? Yeah, I think founders and early stage employees will, will chuckle when I say this, but we all wear a dozen different hats every day and our roles never <laughs> fit nicely into like a title or a skill set bucket, right? And my mantra in the early days and for many startups is just, we got to get shit done. So no matter how you do it, you got to figure it out. You got to teach yourself. And so for me, I'm not technical in the sense of I'm not a software developer, so you won't see me like coding the MVP of a product, but I spent a lot of time thinking about the product and the evolution of that and the product flow. So how does that translate? Well, a lot of our startups these days are a couple of founders, an idea, presentation, maybe a little bit of a direction in terms of a technical uh, roadmap they want to they wanna develop. And especially for the companies that are building software products, first-time entrepreneurs, there's a lot of mistakes they make along the way, right? What product stack do I need? How many developers should I hire per PM? Uh, what's the roadmap? How quickly should I get customer feedback? Um, there's just like a million micro decisions you make as a part of that. And then I think taking a step back, just broadly speaking, being a CEO is really tough. As a founder, you're faced with thousands of decisions every week, many of which you've never made before. So you are learning on the fly and people's jobs and the company is dependent on that. So for me, a lot of the time, I'm a sounding board for founders that just want to know how they should be operating or when they're trying to make tough decisions. So, hey, should I hire a VP of biz dev now? Right. If I do, what's the reporting structure internally? Um, hey, I just closed my first round of capital. How do I like organize my investors and how do I set up payroll and what insurance policy should I have for my employees? Like, There's a million things that founders are faced with that actually have nothing to do with the space technology side that are just, just as important. Um, right, right. More tactically, though, especially for our companies as they scale, a lot of them are looking for customers. They want talented individuals to join their teams. They want to think about launching internationally and expanding their footprint. They want to explore maybe acquiring a smaller company. They want to explore how to deal with competitive dynamics. They want to change their pricing or they want to learn how to build a partnership where the partner sells their solution. There's a million different strategies and things that happen at a company that even though, you know, Jebit in my previous experience wasn't a 
Earth observation constellation with a hyperspectral sensor, there's enough analogies there where 70% of it is the same. And I try to be helpful and offer my perspective for founders when they need it on some of those, some of those things they're struggling with. Right. And did you like also on, on maybe the flip side, did you, as you were having these conversations, did, was there a moment where you realized, oh, I actually have like these skills that maybe aren't as common in this industry because it is in many ways like a bit of a different industry and like you coming in from the outside and having that history of like building a company being like an asset more than than not there were a few light bulb moments for me and it was mainly based on the commentary of other people that kind of helped me put this together of people who were in the space industry and had been in this ecosystem for 5 10 20 years so i'll share a few of them here one comment was you know we don't have a lot of repeat entrepreneurs in space because commercial space age is still so new right so a lot of the founders you see now are really talented folks that have worked at spacex or blue origin or another large company and have been part of that growth journey but they weren't founders they weren't repeat founders because we don't have a ton of exits yet in space and so Part of that was a recognition that there's going to be a lot of first-time founders, and first-time founders need a different type of venture partner and support system as they scale than repeat founders do. So I thought that was interesting. The second comment, which is probably way more in in your world, is we were talking about the opportunity around EO and remote sensing, and the comment was something along the lines of, yeah, there's just all of this really interesting, valuable data that can be collected from these sensors, but... You know, we've been selling it as raw data and now we need to like build analytics and extract insights and we need to like figure out how to like action off of it. Like it's new and we have to educate people and we're struggling to like figure out the value and how do you like connect it to the software and and, like make people use it on a daily basis, not like super technical folks. And I just chuckled because that was exactly a similar set of challenges we dealt with, albeit with a different data set in a different industry, but it was the exact same challenge we dealt with. So that one gave me a little bit more confidence, too, that the professional experience was relevant. And lastly, and this is something that I've reflected on as I've been in space now for a year, my story of coming from outside of space, having built a company with some relevant overlap, but obviously with a lot to learn, coming into the space ecosystem, willing to roll up my sleeves and learn as much as possible and be supportive, that can't be the only story like that. We need dozens of folks like myself to come from other industries into space. We need to be as welcoming as a community as we can because the space ecosystem is increasingly uh, no longer siloed like it maybe has been for a period of time. And it's getting very interconnected with telecom and semiconductor manufacturing and additive manufacturing and enterprise tech stacks and ESG goals. And so the point being that We need people from all walks of life, from different industries coming into space, sharing their perspective and experience. And so I'm really passionate making sure that, you know, I I cannot be the last person who came from a non-space ecosystem and jumped into space and is trying to add value. Um, So we need a lot more folks like that. That's pretty fun that you you say it like that, because I've been following like the space industry for, I don't know, over like 10 years maybe at this point um even like without working directly in it and it feels like there's been this massive change over the past few years where there has been this like huge amount of influx of people coming in where mostly led by spacex which is like oh look there's a different way to build rockets and then there's a different way to do like everything else but what you're saying is like that's not even like enough like we need just like way more than that how do you think like we keep making that attractive like how do how do we make space attractive to to entrepreneurs like not just people who think it's cool and because there is that aspect sometimes that like maybe holds space a little bit down where it's like oh it's this cool thing but it's not a serious thing um especially not if you 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 want to build a company how do we change that how do we attract more people like you who aren't from there who didn't you know grow up looking at the stars and being like oh this is amazing but are seeing maybe more of a business opportunity and and an impact one i think you hit the nail on the head the two things i was going to say are impact and commercial opportunity (laughs) and i think the space industry needs to frame it as that right a lot of my friends that aren't in space they'll joke with me 
you know, hey, have you helped the billionaires get to space yet? Or, hey, are we colonizing Mars? And, like, those are certainly, like, true and fun things that I actually believe may, may happen. Like, I do think by the end of the decade there, there may be human life on Mars. Um, that, that's a possibility, and it's crazy that that is even on the table. And it speaks to how, you know, the, the time and effort of folks in the space industry and where they've gone. But I think for the average person who isn't in space thinking about this all day, what I have found really maybe changes their perspective or, or gets them to start to think about how they can contribute is the fact that at the end of the day, space is just a location for all intents and purposes. And space is a combination of dozens of different subsectors that there are a multitude of ways it can help us make life on Earth better. So if you're really passionate about helping folks in underdeveloped emerging nations or uh, countries, you know, one of the best ways to do that is to you know, help bring the two billion folks that don't have access to uh, reliable, uh, persistent internet to give them constant connectivity and connect them to the rest of the world. Part of that is leveraging remote sensing and earth observation to help identify new underground water sources to help better understand and measure climate change. There are a lot of folks that are really passionate about saving the planet and making life on Earth better through climate progress that don't necessarily realize how fundamental space can be to that. So I think to your point, it's really just about reframing space, not always right. as let's go explore, explore the deep space and beyond space. That is certainly mm -hmm. exciting, but that's more of a research, academic, scientific part of the space industry. The commercial shorter-term opportunity for folks that might attract them to come and help build with us is this idea that you can have a massive impact, there's a lot of really smart people jumping in, and it can make life here on Earth better through some things that you might care about, whether it's connectivity or climate or, or other initiatives. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I feel like part of our job is, like, make space uncool again. Like, not this shiny thing, but, like, show all the other things behind, like, the billionaires and stuff like that. I think that makes a lot of sense. One of, the th one, one of the things that we talk a little bit about with some of our uh, portfolio founders, so we're, uh, we're an investor in Loft Orbital, which is a hosted payload rideshare business. You may know them. Um, we're also um, an investor in, in a company that we haven't announced yet, but is in a similar domain in the sense of um, the government used to own and operate a service, and now it's being privatized, right? But it, it impacts people on a daily basis. Um, it's something they use every day. The point of me sharing those two examples is I think for most consumers and even companies, they won't care what orbit you're yes. in, what type of satellite bus design it is, like what exactly. launch vehicle you took to go on the way up. Like those are important nuances for within the space industry. But for the outside casual observer, you just want your Uber or Google Maps to work. You just want, you know, your very specific weather data to work and, and be accurate based on, on your movements. You just want your Wi-Fi on your flight to work. And so space is becoming this really interesting technical and infrastructural backbone to a lot of our day-to-day -day life for consumers and enterprises. And so I see this great blending of space technologies with other industries and verticals. And to your point, it's totally fine if it's uncool and not sexy. It can have a massive impact still, um, but it's just thought of maybe in a different way. No, I think, I think like, yeah, I think that's one of the things I was excited to talk to you about is like, sometimes it's a bit of a trap to, to have been in the space industry so long and, and be so excited about it, like overly excited about it to the point where, yeah, not everybody is and not everybody should be. And exactly to that, like we need to, like if, if we really want this thing to like take off, like pun intended, um, we need to like build stuff that people don't even think about. And I think we're kind of already there in, in many ways. Like the two examples I use a lot when talking to this is like what you mentioned, like Google Maps, like you want to be able to know like the quickest way home from somewhere in the city. You don't care how it got the answer. Like it could very well be like a mechanical Turk guy in the back who like looked up at a map and told you it was like that. Or it could be um, like an array of all the GPS on your phone that was like, okay, there's no traffic here. And so this is, nobody gives a damn. Like we do because we're excited about it. But then 
the other one is also like weather predictions that you mentioned like everybody wants to know like the weather like you just put the news on and after the news they tell you what the weather is going to be because everybody cares about that nobody cares about how they got that was it from like a sensor on the ground or like a geostationary um satellite like what's the resolution of that satellite I'm like nobody gives a damn like if it tells me if it's going to rain tomorrow or not I'm like that's all i need to know and i think like thinking about it in that way about like how do we deliver like how do we tell people if they need an umbrella tomorrow or not beyond like what's the resolution of the satellite is like a hundred percent i I totally agree (laughs) there's some interesting examples that i feel like we're making progress in that direction okay i'm sure tomorrow.io is often cited on on your podcast but that's just such a well-known recent example of a company that very clearly we would all agree is not a quote unquote space company, but has migrated into the space ecosystem and is launching their own dedicated satellites and constellation. And there's a lot of other examples too, where companies are quote unquote outsourcing space. And I actually think you'll see this more often. So there's two examples that come to mind. One is like a Honeywell or an earth analytics or any of these non space companies like enterprise commercial companies that Probably in the past, they would have either hired internally or consulted with, you know, satellite designers and manufacturers and and brought the components in-house and done assembly and and gone through the entire launch process themselves, right? But now they're outsourcing this to third-party providers, uh, like a Loft Orbital, as an example. Um, Or, you know, they're even satellite companies that we see, like early-stage satellite companies today, are outsourcing the satellite manufacturing and assembly, and they're just focusing on what makes them unique, which is a novel sensor and maybe some software downstream to help, you know, take that data and apply it to a specific industry or vertical they're focused on. And so I actually think what's exciting is we're kind of at the precipice of even the definition of a space company and how, uh, you know, early stage companies are building is changing. And a lot of the hardware, not all of it, but a lot of it can be you know, increasingly commoditized or COTS, you know, components off the shelf um, versus always building everything in-house, which I think just makes the industry more efficient, more scalable, um, and even more attractive to folks like myself, venture investors that want to invest in early stage companies. Yeah, as you were saying that, I was thinking about like what you mentioned earlier about Jebit and like how you built it. And I think it, even kind of sounds ridiculous if you say like, oh, we're going to build a company and then we're going to like create the data ourselves to be able to resell it. And it's like, well, no, that's not how you do it. Like other, like Google just does like a crazy job at that. You're not going to reinvent the wheel there, but they don't know what to do with it. And that's where you come in. You don't need to rebuild the whole data gathering process as well. And I feel like thinking about it like that and, and how in other industries, It has been tackled like that where you don't need to own the whole stack especially one where in space it's very capital intensive and you need to 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 send satellites i think that's an interesting framework to to think about as well like and and i agree with you i think like we might see more of that it's very interesting to see how companies are branding themselves as well like if you go on tomorrow.io's website like who are they trying to talk to and what's their customer and and like yeah there's space and stuff like that but it's not about that and i think that does answer the question about like what do they invest in later on it turns out like they want to take it like a huge step forward and so they need to invest in in the hardware but one of the things i find really interesting in in well earth observation specifically is looking at how do all these companies market themselves like who are they trying to to talk to um there's there's a like a bit of an opposition between like when you want to hire people like the space aspect is a really cool thing to sell like you're going to work on the coolest thing in your life but then when you want to sell it it's really not the thing that companies focus on and i find that to be such an interesting topic to to understand like how are they trying to sell their own stuff and exactly to your point it's not as a space company, taking the, the example of tomorrow.io. Yeah, and, and these things aren't against each other, but you need both no, exactly. to create a successful yeah. space company today. I think that yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's just the difference is in, in new space or in modern space, you need both an internal view of all of the important engineering decisions and internally how you're going to hire and recruit a team and build a team that yeah. has really yeah. deep technical space expertise because at the end of the day, the cliche of space is hard is 100% true for a variety of yeah. reasons. But at the same time, you need an equal external focus of, well, what do my customers really care about? What are they trying to solve for? And I think the reason that that's more pressing than ever before is because the space industry is in this moment of customer exploration, where for right. so long our main customers have only been each other, other space companies, or you know the primes or governmental agencies, right? Whether it's DOD or, or, or Space Force or NASA mm -hmm. or you know other international equivalents. But what's interesting is now that we are really accelerating over the past few years, non-space customers and entities, both here in the U.S. and overseas, that's where I feel like more of the focus and the narrative and the skill set internally at space companies needs to change to be about customer success and product development and marketing and positioning and sales go-to-market strategies um, so that they're talking the language. Because at the end of the day, to your point, they want a problem solved. They don't necessarily care how it's solved. So I want to move on a little bit. And one of the questions I wanted to ask you as well is if we go back a little bit um, further back in the conversation where we were talking about like what you were thinking about doing next and you, you come across the space industry that looks like something that has a pretty big impact and where your, your skill set um, also overlaps a little bit. Why go for investing instead of like building another company? Because like you do have that experience of like you've gone through that you were mentioning like there's a lot of first time founders in the space industry why not leverage that and become like one of the few that isn't a first time uh founder why go for the investing instead i think one of the secrets about being a venture capitalist and this is something a lot of my colleagues and i talk about behind closed doors one of the greatest things is that we are effectively paid to learn all day long and so even if you, you know, built a space company and then you became a space investor, you're still learning, right? Like, okay, cislunar economy is developing now and we're putting data centers on the moon and we're thinking about, you know, like just like different deep space and we're thinking about new sensor types and, okay, now we need to think about downstream applications. There's always something new. There's always companies and CEOs that are pushing the envelope. And so the reality is it is impossible for a VC to understand completely every single industry, every single company they talk to. So the reason I share that is because being a VC effectively, the skill set is not always about knowing everything in advance. It's about the ability to very quickly understand a problem or a sector, understand the opportunity, be able to assess that, and then make an informed decision on it. So the reason I give that context is because for me, I was really excited about leveraging the opportunity to help founders to also learn with them. But at the same time, I have that builder's mentality. And so that's why I didn't join a billion dollar venture capital fund as a partner. I wanted to build my own fund. And so where I spend my time is thinking about how can I build Space VC to be as helpful and impactful, impactful to other founders into the space ecosystem at large. So that still kind of itches my like entrepreneurial founder startup hat. But on the other side, I'm serving currently as like interim COO for a couple of our startups that that want me to be more of an extension of their management team. And it's a great opportunity for me to learn their industry as well, right? The very specific minutia of what they're building, even if I have a complementary skill set. So for me, it's all about how can I be most impactful? What's the learning curve here? And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if in the future I do go and start another software or tech company at some right. point. But I am having a hell of a lot of fun working with some of the smartest, most motivated founders and CEOs I know. And you know, trying to be as helpful as I can be and learning a lot along the way too. Right. That's such a, that's such a fun answer. I like that a lot. Like, and, and how do you keep learning? Like, how do you find the people to, how, how do you find those people to learn from and, and just work with? I think part of this is innate. And so there's a lot of people out here that will, will relate to this when, when I talk through like my personal process. I consume a lot of content. I am constantly on Twitter reading and looking for new information and content um, or LinkedIn, right? Vice versa. Um, I'm constantly consuming YouTube videos at like 1.5 or 1.8 at 8x speed of 
panels at conferences I didn't go to or past keynotes I, I wasn't able to attend, constantly pouring through podcasts. And so for me, it's more around like how quickly can I consume content in a way that allows me to digest it and learn in skill sets and areas that I don't feel like I have or that I want to stay on top of. And that's just like part of my daily routine, right? I'm making lunch. Right. I'll throw on a podcast in the morning when I'm having my morning coffee. I'll sit on the balcony, listen to a YouTube video, you know, at night when I'm in bed, like things like that. It's just part of my routine. More externally focused, though, to your question, I have found that if you are gracious and um, generous and you try to reciprocate with other people, um, I have found people to be very willing to spend 30 minutes talking to me or anyone else about what they've learned and, and giving me, you know, a few golden nuggets that I can kind of add to my, you know, knowledge set and surface area, especially as it relates to space investing. So I try to take a really humble approach. Every day I'm learning. Every conversation is an opportunity to learn something new. It's also an opportunity to share maybe some of the things that I've learned that can add value to that person. And then it's just about doing the work. There's just no substitute, yeah. even if you've been investing in space for 20 years, to do the work, to constantly learn, reinvent yourself and to try and be ahead of the curve so you can help your, your founders and portfolio companies. That's the way that I try to approach it. That's pretty cool. I like the, like, I, I feel like, I don't know if this is a generational thing, but I feel like I hear a lot of younger folks mentioning, like, just a lot of YouTube and a lot of podcasts. And, like, I do think there's, I mean, I'm a bit biased there, but I think it's really fun to hear like a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds, like trying to absorb a lot through mediums like that at a velocity that we probably couldn't before. Um, on that note, like one of the things I found really interesting, you, you wrote a blog post about like why you're starting a space fund. And one of the things you mentioned there is wanting to build in public. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you mean by building in public? And I'd like to, yeah, follow on, on based on that. One of the experiences I had as a founder that was often pitching venture capitalists, I pitched hundreds of VCs over a decade um, as we were raising you know, capital across five rounds. And I was kind of always a little bit annoyed of the facade that some VCs put up in terms of mm -hmm. like, they had it all figured out, they had all the answers, like they kind of like dictated the future. And... So the part, part of the comment, the reason I make that comment and, and part of the reason I stated that in the blog post was because I wanted to be humble and open-minded and always willing to learn because I realized that this industry was changing so much and I realized that I was coming in with a slightly different perspective. So that was like ground one. I wanted to acknowledge that. The second thing, though, was as part of that journey, I realized and I hoped that others would join me in jumping from non-space industries into space. And I knew that if we were going to make that pathway more possible – I needed to build in public and talk about what was going well and what wasn't going well. So what I've tried to do is I've tried to just be really honest, both in like a private email setting in like a, a, a monthly and quarterly um, updates that I send out to a certain audience um, or whether it's on LinkedIn and, and Twitter in my posts. I try to be really honest about, about our progress. So unlike most VCs, you know, I was posting how much capital we had raised, how many, you know, what the average check size was how much we had deployed, like data that you would normally just keep behind. But I wanted to build in public and show people, A, that we're thinking about building a VC firm regardless of the industry, because that's also a new phenomena, right? Um, how to do it as a first-time fund manager. But also I wanted to kind of show people what the traction was and, and be really transparent about that um, as I built Space VC. I think the aspect that I haven't spent as much time on as I would like is – and this is a little bit more, uh, more difficult because it's not 100% my decision, but I would love for all of our companies to also build more in public too. Right. So to talk about new developments with their technology, to talk about here's a mistake we made as we were manufacturing our satellite, here's what we learned from it, um, here's a product decision that we made around going after this target market and we recognized that that actually wasn't as advantageous. I recognize that that's really difficult to get people comfortable to talk publicly about because there's a competitive dynamic. I, t I totally understand that. But what I found coming from a hyper-competitive industry is that the more truthful and honest and upfront you are, it actually attracts a larger crowd and audi audience and customer set for you than it detracts competitively. So I think in the next chapter of this, I'd really like to work with our portfolio companies to make sure that they're continuing to build 
as in public as they feel comfortable doing so. Right. Yeah. One of the reasons I wanted to ask that question as well is, is like following the, the point we were talking about before is like, I feel like for everybody that's like reading and listening and watching stuff, like you need people talking about it. And so I, I wonder if also like you putting stuff out there, you've seen the, like the benefits of like just people knowing you're out there, like just right now, like I probably would not have reached out to you if you were not on, on Twitter or, or on LinkedIn. Um, like, is that also something that you've found to be useful as like, oh, people, you know, that that you're out there and are going to be listening to well podcasts or like tweets and things like that. And is that like also a source of motivation for like that ability to put stuff out there, even the even the things that are not as, as shiny or maybe especially the things that are not as shiny? I find that really smart entrepreneurs that are thoughtful want to work with other smart, thoughtful people. And so the content that I put out there, I try to be honest and thoughtful about my own learnings and what we've done right and what we've done poorly. And I, and I do hope that to a certain extent, extent, other folks that are like that would be interested in working and collaborating with people like that. And so whether that's other VCs, there are a lot of really great VCs in space that, that I've gotten to know that I co-invest with. Um, founders that are building interesting companies or even you know, employees at space companies that are thinking in the future about building space companies. I've talked to a lot of them too about my experience. Um, that's, that's part of our job as, as VCs is to be supportive to our current generation of portfolio companies, but also to future generations as well and future portfolio companies and adding value to the whole ecosystem. So yeah, definitely part of it I would say is, you know, you, you have to get your name out there as a VC because otherwise, you know, not every yeah. deal falls nicely in your inbox. And, you know, <laughs> so I just try to do it in a way that's really, um, like really fits my style, right? You're not going to see me banging the drum on Twitter talking about how awesome we are and, and, you know, why you should do this and that. Um, but you know, if there's something worth sharing and I get excited about it, I definitely want people to know that hopefully we're building something cool. Right. Yeah. I think that's, that's, that's pretty fun. Like, so let's, let's get there actually. Like, how do you, you've been doing space VC for a year now. Is that, did I get that right? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Just over a year, March, March of last year we launched. Okay. Right. So right in the middle of COVID and <laughs> like, how do you, like you, you just said it, like, not everything lands in your inbox. So how do you hear about, how do you keep an eye out on, on, on the companies out there? You were mentioning like you're, you're pretty active on Twitter as well. I'm guessing not everything is on Twitter. Like it has to get to a certain stage before it ends there. Like there's a lot of like what is referred to as like stealth mode where people are building stuff but not openly talking about it. How do you try to keep up and hear about those things that aren't necessarily at the stage where they are public right now. Yeah. The short answer is just consistently networking and consistently learning and trying to be ahead of the curve, whether it's on individuals that might start companies or on trends or areas that might be worth investing in. To dive a little bit deeper into that, part of our responsibility as VCs is to diversify our relationships and networks and make sure that we're kind of everywhere all at once, if that makes sense. So I do get a lot of inbound on Twitter and LinkedIn, and, and that's very natural for me because I spend a lot of time right. there. But, you know, we get inbounds on our website as well, people going and wanting to reach out. We get introductions from other VCs. You know, uh, so some of our investments have actually come from non-space folks, which I think is actually really telling. A lot of my network outside of space, I've become their go-to space guy. And so okay. when they find something interesting, they think of us. And I think that can be very helpful, too. And so we've just tried to be thoughtful and differentiate whether it's us reaching out to founders that, you know, we've discovered that we think they're building something interesting. And when I reach out, it does not mean we're going to invest by any means, but it means I think you're building something really interesting that's kind of within the realm of what our firm focuses on. And I'd love to have a conversation. Um, you know, there are some categories, though, given that space is just so broad that we're not spending a lot of time thinking about investing in. So we may spend less time trying to, you know, develop networks or really focus our time and attention there right now. One example that my non-space friends will ask me all the time, you know, are you investing in asteroid mining or, you know, exploring like deep space and other solar systems and, you know, terraforming Mars. And again, as we kind of alluded to earlier, 
our venture firm has to invest in commercially viable businesses. Like that's what, at the end of the day, we are trying to do is invest in companies that have the ability to scale both through government and commercial opportunities. And so I don't spend a lot of time networking with, you know, the academia that might be exploring deep space or astronomers. It's really freaking cool. And I follow a lot of them on Twitter, yeah. but that's just not how I'm able to prioritize my time right now. So I think that's the really honest answer of how we try to approach it. That's really fun because in many ways, what you just described is how I look for guests for the podcast, which is like a completely different approach, but it's the same thing about like, I don't invest in, but it's like a time investment about like, there's a lot of people you reach out to and they do really cool stuff, but not everybody makes for a good guest or for an interesting conversation. And I find that very fun that like the way you phrase it, it felt quite similar in terms of it's just like a, a different kind of investment but like at least for me it makes a lot of sense like the, the, the way you were mentioning it so you hear a lot about well, these I'll, people. I'll, I'll give you one more yep please i'll give you one more example too just to build on that analogy the more podcast guests you have too i'm sure some of those guests will introduce oh, yeah. you to other interesting people and the network effects of that have compounded right some of the CEOs and founders that we've invested in that are doing very, very well, Hawkeye 360, Loft Orbital, Pixel, et cetera, they've introduced us to interesting companies. And so there's second and third order, Matt, you know, kind of effects as well, too, as, as we get, you know, hopefully a reputation for being very founder friendly and adding true value to, to companies. Then, you know, people start to reach out a little bit more and realize that, you know, maybe we should we can be a small part of their journey. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Like this notion of compounding effects and reputation, I think are two uh, elements that make a lot of sense about like, oh, I see you've worked with this person before, or I've heard about you there before. And then like that just slowly builds up over time. That makes a lot of sense. So you hear a lot about like, you have a, a, a very wide net. Um, and then, you know, there's this analogy of like a funnel. How do you then choose or decide like who are the people that you want to invest in i think it depends a little bit at what stage we meet them so what i mean by that is most venture capital firms are focused at a particular part of the journey so maybe that's day one pre-seed seed very early on likely no revenue and just building the product some venture capital firms are focused on growth they have customers they have a product they're trying to accelerate they want to go public and they need capital and executional help. And what's interesting about our approach as a venture capital firm is we actually decided to do a little bit of both. And the reason that's interesting is because a lot of our LPs have never invested in space before. These are CEOs and entrepreneurs that kind of want a nice diversified basket of space investments. So the reason I share that context to start is because when I'm sitting down with the CEO of someone who's raising $150 million as part of a Series C or a Series D, the way I evaluate their business is very different than meeting a founding team of three engineers that have a pitch deck and have a great idea but haven't built a business around it yet. And so if you're evaluating early stage companies, a lot of the time it comes down to people in the team, and we can dive more into that if you want, but especially as a former founder, I... I feel like I have a really good sense for what people are cut out for the startup journey and, and which ones maybe aren't quite there yet. The vision is really important. The ability for the founding team to articulate what the opportunity is, what the problem they're trying to solve is, and why their approach is going to be differentiated. Again, this is early stage before they have a product, before they have revenue. Of course, if there's an MVP of the product, if there's you know a, a technical roadmap, we want to diligence that too and make sure that is there space heritage? Is this something completely new that's never been done before? Um, what are the technical risks as a part of that? So we, we certainly diligence that. And then we spend a lot of time thinking about the market because one of the things that, uh, again, maybe I say things that publicly that other VCs wouldn't want me to say, but one of the things that VCs talk about is that you likely will do better investing in an average team but the right market versus a stellar team but the wrong market. And the reason that's the case is because kind of, you know, the rising tide lifts all boats analogy. If you're investing in the right market, there's going to be so much attention and capital and customer focus within that area 
that even if you don't completely nail the execution or even if you know you lose a co-founder along the way, you could still have a really good outcome. Versus if you have the best team possible, but you are building a constellation around Jupiter right now, there's just no market there for that. And so that's the challenge a lot of the time in the early stage is really being thoughtful on our side as a VC before we even engage a startup. What do we think about this market? Doing our homework so that when we check the other boxes, uh, team and tech risk and things like that, we can move and write a check very quickly because we've done the homework on the market and we have a point of view on it. Do you feel comfortable telling me, like, for some of the Earth observation um, companies that you've invested in, like, what was the thing that made you invest in them? Yeah, absolutely. So there's like Hawkeye. Let me start with Pixel. And... All right. Yeah. Cool. Pixel. Yeah. Can you like no, let's no, let's good. describe? Um, I'm not. Sure, I don't think everybody's familiar with them. Can you describe a little bit like what they do and yeah, go from there. Yeah, Pixel is building the world's largest hyperspectral constellation. So they have hyperspectral uh, sensors. They're they're building their own satellite buses, and they're building this really interesting data set, uh, hyperspectral multi-wave, um, to, to leverage in a variety of industries. I think what pushed us over the edge on Pixel was a combination of things. And obviously, this is where, given that it's a public podcast, I'll share what I can, but I don't want to get ahead yeah, of, of the course. company in terms of some of their exciting developments that they've done. But I really like the founding team. Young entrepreneurs, they came from Hyperloop One India. Um, they're building in Bangalore. They have a very um, underdog mentality about them. And they're, as my Bostonian friends would say, wicked smart. Um, they're very smart. And um, uh, they just have such clear vision about them in terms of what they want to build. So from a team standpoint, that was a very easy box to check after spending a few hours with them. Most importantly, though, what differentiated Pixel across other companies, I would say, is, and I'll have to be a little vague here, but I think one of the advantages in Earth Observation today is how efficiently, in terms of capital, how efficiently can you build a constellation? Because at the end of the day, it's about how much capital does it cost to put up a constellation, and then you have to pass those costs to customers. And depending on how expensive it is, that is going to change how much you have to charge. And there's an advantage to being you know, cheaper than other providers. So that was certainly one interesting thing about their approach. The other was the amount of commercial traction they had already received. So they had already pre-sold out and had done a lot of work on um, you know, some, of the, some of their constellation that hadn't even launched yet. And so, you know, the commercial traction was very appealing for us because, again, we want to invest in companies that are ideally, you know, always dual use. Um, the government's not the only customer. And then the last thing I would say is they, I, I won't say what it is, but they had a very clear point of view and strategy around how their customers were going to experience value from the data. So there's a lot of debate in the EO ecosystem right now about do I build the full application myself? Do I build developer tools for other people to build on top of? Do I do bulk data sales? Do I just partner with resellers? And there's not one clear answer. And it depends on the company and kind of the sensor type and, and what your competitive set is. But Pixel had a very compelling view on that. And so for us, that was uh, an important checkbox as well because you know we wanted to invest in a company that we felt they were building a modern uh, space company that had a, an appropriate strategy, maybe not as representative of past EO companies. So that that's Pixel, right? That's that makes me like really excited to, to to see what they come up with. Like it's one of those companies that's been like following for a little while, and I think that's there's pretty big potential to change the hyperspectral game. And I think that's it's very fun because when you you hear a lot of the conversations around Earth observation, you hear about optical and then synthetic aperture radar SAR, but like multispectral hasn't really made it in the, um, it, I want to say mainstream, but like for the industry, at least, uh, like it's not mainstream where like my mom knows what SAR is. That's not the point. Um, and like, I feel like within the industry, multispectral isn't quite there yet. And I'm, I'm very excited to, to see what it comes, uh, comes up with. Uh, on that note, like one of the things I was curious about is as far as I could tell, and please tell me if I'm wrong, but you haven't invested in on on more of the analytics side. Uh, it was more on the like like companies who are building hardware, and 
I think I heard you on a previous interview mention that you really like the like software and SaaS kind of aspect. Um, and so that's really interesting to me that like it felt like a lot of the companies that you have invested in are hugely capital uh, intensive and are building hardware, but you didn't have those companies that were the ones that you founded before or that you felt attracted to. Um, can you tell a little bit more about like, first of all, is that is that right? Did I get that right? And if so, like, why is that the case? Yeah, so I would say uh... 70%, that's correct. The only nuance I'll <laughs> add to it is um, like some of the hardware companies we've invested in also have software components of their business, but they still are putting constellations in space. So Loft Orbital has really interesting software they've developed to kind of operationalize the everything right. from when they first interact with a customer all the way through launch and post-ops, right? Um, Cosmic Shielding Corp is a radiation shielding company, but they actually have uh, an early piece of software that detects solar flares and can help you action against that. So like a lot of the businesses we invest in do have some components of both, but you're 100% right that a lot of them are, are hardware oriented. I would say as it relates to Earth observation software opportunities, we have one investment we've made that isn't public yet, which is in that domain. But even so, part of it is just based on where the industry is today. And I haven't felt okay. like some of the existing solutions match exactly what maybe we're looking for. Part of the issue too is venture capital is like a very specific type of financing. And so we, when we invest, expect like massive growth in returns, even if it's not over a short period of time, but like that's kind of the focus. What I actually think the industry needs uh, for earth observation software is very, very specific specialized applications in specific industries. And, you know, as a part of that, you need deep domain expertise and that doesn't always isn't as obviously scalable across multiple very different industries. It's 100% possible, but it's just not as obvious. So the reason I share that is because it may be that venture capital is not the best solution for those types of companies. It may be that uh, a roll-up strategy, meaning someone who comes and acquires four or five different software EO companies and then combines them together is a more efficient way. Part of it may be in a few years' time, once, you know, uh, SAR and optical, high resolution optical and um, hyperspectral and, uh, you know, synthetic aperture. Once that becomes even more prevalent on the collection side, maybe it allows for a larger ecosystem of downstream applications, right? And so part of it is a timing thing. Part of it is an approach thing. The last thing I would say is, um, and I want to be careful how I position this because uh, this is just one data point and this is just my opinion, but I think it's going to be very hard for a single player to come in and try and aggregate all of the EO data, build this massive marketplace and kind of like have a, a walled garden around it, like a foothold. It seems unlikely that that is how that is going to shake out. And there's a lot of companies that are pursuing that because of course, why wouldn't you be? You, you want to be the one single walled garden that controls all of the data um, and ha you know plays nice with everyone, but then also has massive margins yourself. But I don't know if that's going to be the case. And I don't, I don't know that anyone knows exactly how this is going to evolve. So a lot of our job as VCs is sometimes to be patient and to see how the ecosystem plays out and to invest where the opportunities are. And right now, I'm getting really excited about best-in-class sensor types, so the best radio frequency uh, monitoring and, and, and measurement service in, rate, in Hawkeye 360, the best hyperspectral service in Pixel. And as software downstream applications you know, continue to build and mature as well, um, I think that's an area that, to your point, we will definitely invest more increasingly in moving forward. Oh, this is so fun. Like, I talked with Jeff Cruzy, who's another, like, in my opinion, prominent venture capitalist in, in the field. And he had a bit like the other take, which is like, oh, he completely sees like this common platform where you can aggregate everything, not just EO data as becoming a thing. And that's really fun that you're like, I don't know if that's going to work or, or how it would work. And like, that's just, it makes me happy. Like, oh, we're in an exciting field where we have no idea where this is going. And there's like still a lot of things to invent and figure out, like, what do we do with, with all of this thing? Real quick, though, I will say I love Jeff and he's very smart. <laughs> so I would, want, I would never want to bet against Jeff. 
And we, and we oftentimes see eye to eye completely on these things. But I think the broader point is, you know, the ecosystem is not developed or dictated by any one person's view. And there's no right or wrong answer. I mean, maybe there are some wrong answers or some wrong, you know, inclinations. But the, the point is that it's going to be a really exciting time for Earth observation. And, and what, what maybe I should clarify is that I think what you described as Jeff's position, I think that would add tremendous value to the ecosystem. It would be tremendously valuable to have something from collections to analytics to insights to action, like the full kind of pre, pre-analysis, of course, as well. But w- what I'm expressing is maybe skepticism or hesitancy yeah. that anyone currently can execute against that, or more specifically, that someone who has a constellation is also going to be that player. I think it has to be a third party, right. downstream, independent, in, independent company. It may be a startup, but it may also be Palantir, right? It may be right, right, right. Microsoft or Amazon that come in from the compute side. So um, it, it's early to tell still, but there's a lot of exciting development for sure. Yeah, and, and I also like hope that we can have these like very open conversation and disagree with each other still in a very like respectable manner. And I think back to your point about like earlier you were mentioning like companies and, and teams who seek people who they disagree with and try to challenge things. And I think like I personally like wanna have a place where we can do that in public and, and have each other come and talk about these things. And it's super exciting to see that at least it feels like there's a like very, um, there's a word in French for that and I can't find the word in English, but it's a very like um, nice approach. Like um, it, it's, it's with good intent, I think would be the best way to say it. Like where people challenge each other's ideas, even on Twitter, I find like there's a lot of people who disagree with each other, but in always a very positive intent. And I think overly curious and people are just really excited about this industry and wanting to figure out uh, just where things are going. And a lot of these people have skin in the game, like you, like me, like it's different, but it's still, there is something there. And, and I find that I, I want to cherish that in this industry. I hope it continues like that where people can disagree with each other, but have those conversations still very respectfully. One of the things that I so, yeah. was uh, immediately like pleased to see about space was just how much there was of this audience of fans, for lack of a better term, like just people that wanted to see the success of companies in space for, for like the sake of it. That is very different from my background in enterprise SaaS. And so that has been a very welcome, pleasant evolution to be a part of. And I do think we need to harness that respectful disagreement, debate, constantly iteratively improving the industry. You know, Joe Morrison is a great example of this where yeah. he has such a clever, uh, witful approach to pointing out the flaws in the industry and how we need to self-improve. And voices like Joe and others, I think, do a great job of just continuing to self-educate all of us and, and holding us accountable as an industry and thinking about how we need to evolve and grow. Um, and so we need more voices like that for sure. Yeah, and I think it's a really exciting time to to take part in these conversations because a lot of these people, like yourself, like Jeff, like Joe, are very approachable as well. And it's not like if you had that in a different industry where you had, you know, people from Apple and Microsoft and Amazon coming together and having these conversations even in public, they wouldn't be as approachable either way. And I do feel like there is this thing where someone can come on Twitter and like take part in the conversation relatively easily, or at least I, I, I feel like it's relatively easily. And that's a really like special place to be in as well, because we could get to that like very mature place where it is like settled players who, you know, have built the rules of the game and know each other. And so they can have these conversations, but nobody could come in as well and, and change that and just as to your point earlier, there is a lot of people coming in and we need more people coming in and still we can maintain that, which is pretty impressive. And I don't know, it's point of pride, I think, to be in that industry as well. I want to move on a little bit and I'd like to hear your thoughts about um, what we're seeing today with a lot of companies uh, going public. So there's a lot of companies going public 
uh, via our SPAC. Um, I don't know if that's very relevant or not, but what we're seeing, at least right now at the moment of recording, is a lot of these space companies that have gone public, their stock is not doing really great. And so I would like to know what you think about that, if you have any thoughts, actually, on that, like seeing that it's it's pretty industry-wide that, at least on the short term, in the few, like, one year, like, two years to few months, these companies have gone public. It's not, like, skyrocketing high up. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I have a lot of thoughts on that, actually. I think part of it is timing. Part of it is quality of company and who went public. And part of it are incentives. So maybe let me unpack that kind of, like, quickly sure. between one, Please. two, and three. So in terms of timing, even if you were to take some of the best non-space companies, Shopify or C or Palantir or whatever your favorite high growth tech stock is, likely it's not doing too well over the last 12 months anyways. And that is a much larger macro conversation about you know, 40% of all US dollars being printed and the massive kind of like democratization of investing in terms of like individual growth in tech stocks. And like, I think there's like a macro argument to be made that like, any stock in the last 12 months is probably going to pour, it, perform fairly poorly. So I think some of that is a little bit unlucky in terms of like when some of these space companies are hitting the market. In terms of quality of company, though, one of the things that concerns me is I don't want public market investors, both small individual retail investors and large institutional investors, to think that um, space companies that have LOIs but no revenue, are still very much in the research and development phase, you know, are not consistently launching or operational, like they don't have a lot of revenue. That's not the high quality space company that we see in the private markets. And so not all SPACs are created equal. SPACs are a source of funding. And some folks took advantage of large amounts of public funding to get liquidity. And, you know, that, that is their fiduciary responsibility. They are supposed to, you know, drive a return as a, for shareholders, whether you're the CEO or you're a board member. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that, that those companies are ready to be public companies. And so I find that some of the space companies that went public without naming names uh, are very early on that maturity and growth curve. And public market investors didn't know how to handle and rate and, and invest in those types of companies where... You know, they only have massive up into the right forecasts and they don't have recurring revenue or customers or like a, a P&L that they could analyze. It's more of a product development bet, right? So that's the second thing. The third thing about incentives is that I, I have seen, and this is a, a positive note, really strong late stage space companies avoiding SPACs in the last 12 months because of the perception that it brings. And I think you okay. will see more space companies going public through direct listings or more traditional IPOs. And I think that's really important because there are extremely high quality space companies that are both public and that are private, but the SPAC label brings a lot of incentive, perverse incentives potentially with it. And I know the SEC is changing the rules and guidance a little bit on that, um, but it seemed like everyone was raising a SPAC for a period of time and searching for a target and just kind of trying to take a late stage company. Oh, you're a series A company with 2 million in revenue. Awesome. Let's put a 300x multiple on it and call it a billion dollar company and push it to the public markets, right? Uh, you're seeing way less of that activity today. And I think that's a good thing for incentives. So what, what I would say, though, is longer term, in order for space companies that are public to be successful, they need to solve the same problems that we're focused on solving in the private markets, which is how do we continue to expand who your customer set is? How do you continue to make it simple for new customers to sign up and try, especially for Earth observation, remote sensing? How do you keep retention really high? How do you innovate and keep cost of capital low for capital intensive businesses? Um, and, and how do you maybe change the perception of what a space company is? The last thing I'll say is I actually think some of the space companies that are public are a really interesting buying opportunity. Like Black Sky, as an example, is, my personal opinion, criminally undervalued right now. And so I don't have inside knowledge on this, but if I was you know, an acquirer, and that was a strategic asset for me, I might put in a bid to acquire Black Sky and bring it private again, right? Or, you know, if you think that has a really interesting growth story in front of it. So I think there are a lot of companies in this high interest rate environment that their stock price is down, but that does not necessarily correlate to their 
business progress right. or the quality of the company that it is. And the fun part of being an investor is you have to figure out which one is which. <laughs> this is the kind of thing where I kind of want to like, I like this idea of like taking these also um, gambles, but not necessarily with like investing directly in them, but like as a fun thing and like seeing in 10 years where we would be like taking a, a I think it's even more fun if it's in public and being like, I think this is what's going to happen and I'm probably going to be wrong, but this is why I think all these things and then coming back later and, and being like, well, that didn't work out. And the only thing is that when you're investing, you're doing that, but there is money on the line. So in a way, it's a lot more fun for me not having money on the line on that side. But thanks for saying that. Um... There's one thing I actually wanted to ask, like this is a completely different subject, but it did cross my mind and I wanted to ask like, you are really young, like, and, and like you started, I forgot where I read there, but like, I think it was actually on like Wikipedia. They, they mentioned like, you're one of the youngest people to have raised venture capital. Like, I, can't help but ask like how is imposter syndrome like have you gone through moments where you're like what the heck am i doing <laughs> and how have you like just dealt with that yes i've definitely gone through imposter syndrome i think anyone that any i don't want to say anyone that's doing something worthwhile but i, I i'll rephrase and say many people that are building ambitious projects naturally will feel imposter syndrome. And I think that's good because that means it's, you're pushing yourself and your personal limits slightly beyond what's comfortable, even if you're the most experienced CEO in the world or you're you know, a day one founder. I think for me, this is gonna sound cliche and I didn't always do this perfectly well. So a lot of this is hindsight 2020. I'm 28 years old now compared to when I was 18 years old raising venture capital like as a college dropout. But the importance of who you surround yourself with and the information you consume I can't overstate how important that is. And I find that that actually just accelerates over time and, and compounds even more. And so in, not in a sleazy way of like, oh, you need to network and get out there and get to know everyone. But I find that people are genuinely focused on building long-term impact and are, are focused on long-term relationships versus short-term transactions and are focused on building lifelong kind of approach life with a lifelong learner's mentality versus, you know, oh, I didn't know the answer to that question. Like, I'm going to feel maybe, you know, a, a little, uh, uh, you know, yeah, embarrassed by that, or I can't remember the term I was looking for. But, you know, for me, those are the, the attributes that I've tried to hold on to. And I've certainly been taught by others that have done this really well, um, mentors. And so I would recommend you, you grab mentors as well. Um, but for me, I was kind of always the, you know, Actually, I'll tell you a funny story if we have time for it. I, I think your sure. listeners might be interested in this. When we were raising venture capital, I went to New York City uh, for a trip once. And I think I was 19 years old. And I was meeting with potential customers as well. And um, I had to meet a, a, a C-level executive at um, like a restaurant or a bar. It was like a 5 p.m. meeting. And I was really trying to meet with her while I was in town. Um, and uh, I, w I wasn't allowed in the bar because I was underage, and <laughs> I had to I had to email her, I had to email her to to leave. But it was like I can't remember if it was it wasn't pre iPhone, but maybe I just wasn't cool enough to have an iPhone or something. I had to connect to Wi Fi, and it was this whole thing where basically like fifteen or sixteen minutes into a thirty minute meeting, I still wasn't there, and she left, and I was trying to email her to come outside the bar and and like meet across the street at Starbucks. Anyways, the reason I share that story is because. There are massive moments of humiliation along the journey where you feel like you have imposter syndrome and you question yourself. I once remember going into our largest customer's office and they asked me if I was here for an internship interview. And so like th in those in those moments you just have to like yeah, sometimes they're frustrating, sometimes it's like upsetting, but you just have to remember uh, you know to be humble, um to to try and think about the long term and I kind of wore it as a badge of honor the more mistakes yeah. that were made along the way that 
I wanted to be that person that stood out in the room and didn't look like everyone else. In fact, if I was like everyone else, then maybe I was in the wrong room. And so um, those are just some fun stories uh, along the way that I thought you might like. <laughs> yeah, I think, and I think like that's also a cool way to think about it when these things do happen to you. Like it's probably not really easy, but like thinking that you do have a cool story to tell for later. And I'll, and I'll translate it to yeah. like space, space now just really quickly is, you know, in some regards, some of those lessons are very helpful now as I build a venture capital firm for the first time, as I'm investing in a, the space domain, you know, broadly speaking for the first time and, and working with founders, right? Like a lot of those same skills and like lessons learned about imposter syndrome, you know, apply now, but it doesn't change necessarily the vision or the drive or the motivation yeah. to build the best venture capital firm to help space companies possible. And, you know, I want to surround myself with really talented other VCs that are doing it. You know, sure, we might compete from time to time on specific deals, but I rarely find that. Most of the time, founders want to surround themselves with as many talented investors as possible. So I try to take a very collaborative approach and surround myself with other smart people in the ecosystem. And so even if you're trying to build something and be the best at it, that doesn't mean you have to have sharp elbows. You can still be very collaborative with others in the ecosystem. Yeah, I, I think that's pretty wise. Like, I think there is this thing about, and I think it, it gets back to what we were saying about building in public. Like, when you do acknowledge that you can be wrong, like, being wrong doesn't become, uh, like, it's detached from you as an individual, like, it's like, oh, you made a mistake, but it's not you who's like at fault or, or, or I mean, yes, it can be, but like, it's not um, a take on your identity. It's more on the process that led you there. And and I think that is a way in which it, it helps like keep up sometimes with that aspect of like, yeah, I was wrong. That's okay. I was wrong before so many other times that it's going to happen again. One of the things that I think is interesting about venture capital and, and the role of investing to your point about like being wrong in all likelihood, all of our portfolio companies will not be successful. That that's yeah. just the reality of it. I hope, I hope all of our portfolio companies are, I hope every space company is successful, but that's, that's just physically impossible. So what's really interesting about our, our job as VCs is we have to spend a lot of time thinking because we only make a handful of decisions that impact the success of our fund. Right, like I think Space VC right now has like twelve or thirteen portfolio companies. So objectively speaking, that means I've made twelve or thirteen decisions. Obviously, there's a thousand micro decisions behind the scenes, but twelve or thirteen decisions that will dictate the success of this fund or not. Broadly speaking, again, right. And so I think a lot of the time, to your point around like taking ownership of wrong decisions or you know how do you approach decision making. Um, being a VC is almost like, for me, a very different muscle than when I was a founder. As a founder, mm -hmm. you're making hundreds of decisions a day. You need to move quickly, get shit done. If you bat like 70%, that's perfect. As a VC, you make a very small number of massive decisions. And so you need to be insanely thoughtful and pragmatic and like calm and steady in that approach versus I found as a founder, it was a little bit more of a roller coaster. So anyways, just wanted to throw in that nuance is, is like a, a little bit of an interesting journey I've been on on the last year as I learned to build that venture capital muscle myself. Yeah, no, I can imagine like that is a, a, a like very different exercise. It's like playing a different sport, I'm guessing. Like it, even if you have that, you, you know how to train and you know how to exercise and diet is important. Like the rules of the game are different. And so you still need to like learn them along the way. I can imagine that is a very different decision-making process um how have you approached like taking those really big decisions like has it been paralyzing at some point where it's like because those are such big decisions to to make compared to like smaller ones and so you can on a day to day maybe the stakes feel lower how how have you dealt with taking those much bigger decisions I don't necessarily feel the pressure of the decisions, but what I, I felt early on was a lack of comfort of not having all the available information in front of me. Right. One of the things I learned very quickly about being an investor is as much as you research and diligence a company, there's always going to be things that are unclear. It is not a black and white decision. You can't quantify it. You can try and make it a very data-driven decision. You can try and do a ton of research and diligence. You can talk to 
experts and customers and interview everyone at the company and diligence the technology. But at the end of the day, you will still only have a partial picture based on your perspective, your diligence, and your viewpoint. And so early on, I would say that that was more intimidating than it is today. I've increased my level of comfortability of investing without the full picture. A, because we're in an industry where founders are raising very quickly, so we have to make decisions quickly, and we don't have weeks or months or quarters to make decisions. Sometimes we have to make a decision in 48 hours. And so, you know, right. getting more comfortable with that pace and going into conversations more educated and well-researched with an informed point of view, that's why going back to the very beginning of our conversation, the daily content you consume, podcasts, YouTube videos, research papers, that's why for me that is so helpful because I'm always staying on top of hopefully what is the most interesting areas of space to invest in. That way when an opportunity presents itself, we can move quickly versus starting from scratch and trying to learn that, you know, subsector of the ecosystem uh, in 48 hours, which is just impossible. So, yeah, that sounds like it's even harder. <laughs> um, I want to like start rounding off and like I said, I wanted to come back to it. So I, I really do like what's attractive about settlers of Catan. Settlers of Catan is when you master the rules one of the most simple games in terms of rules, one of the most complex games in terms of strategy, every board is different. So in Settlers, the board is always different. The pieces move around, so every time is new, unlike Monopoly or something, which is you know the, the hotel spots are always in the same spots, right? Catan is always a different board. So depending on the board and depending on the numbers, you have to have a different strategy every time. So that's what I love about it. I love the fluidity of it. I love the fact that when you sit down to play the game, you don't know what strategy you need in that moment. And your strategy could also change depending on the players and how they're playing and how aggressive they are. And if you're playing with friends, you know, Catan is notoriously the game where you lose friendships in a, in a joking way because it's so easy to like screw other players over. And so in my friend group, I'm notoriously like overly competitive at Catan and I get upset for like three minutes after I lose and then I'm fine. But it's, um, it's just a very fun game to play given you know, just how different each experience and game can be. It's also fairly quick, too. So I like games that aren't six hours. You can play a game in 30, 45 minutes and play a few games in a row. So um, it's, been a, it's been something I've leaned on from time to time while building companies or investing that has distracted me and has been a fun uh, way to, to, you know, hang out with other investors or founders. That's pretty cool. I like that. Like, it's it's fun seeing, like, how... And to go on a little bit of a tangent, like, I like board games a lot. And, like, a, there's been a surge and in, in a rise in, like, board games and, like, it, it, a boom in it. And, like, older games, like Settlers of Catan, who were, like, there before it was cool. Like, I, I forgot how old Settlers of Catan is, but it's, it's, like, 20 or 30 years old, I think, something like that. That this is still a game that keeps getting recommended, I feel like that's just such a interesting thing and shows how well of a game it is to, to, to play. Um, it's very easy to draw lots of analogies to everything we talked about, but I'll leave it at that. Um, I want to round the conversation off. Um, so I like finishing the conversations, like asking the same thing as well. And I feel like it's going to be relatively easy here. I do like asking people for, for books or recommendation or podcast recommendations, um, specifically books and podcasts, because I think they're some of the harder to discover and to hear about. YouTube has a great recommendation system. Um, but I feel like books and podcasts is still a lot of, um, it's people talking about it um, and uh, word of mouth. That's the expression I was looking for. And so, yeah, I, I wonder if there's any that you would recommend um, and why you would recommend them. Not necessarily, by the way, not necessarily on, on the space industry or, or not necessarily anything that we just talked about, just things that you think are interesting and would be worth uh, sharing. Yeah. Um... So I consume a lot of podcast content. I think the two that have stayed in my healthy diet that I listen to all the time are the All In podcast and the Acquired podcast. And I like them for different reasons. The All In podcast is 
recent news events and people that are on the inside at the top levels giving their perspective on it. Many of your viewers will probably know the All In podcast with Chamath and Jason and um, David Friedberg and David Sachs. And so for me, that's very interesting because it kind of like takes what's happening in real life and putting myself in a conversation with other really smart people. Um, And there's a good community around it. The Acquired podcast is great for a totally different reason. They go extremely focused and narrow on one company or one topic, and they may spend four hours talking about it on a podcast doing super deep research. And I love the depth that that brings too. And so, you know, if if the uh, All In podcast goes wide, the Acquired podcast goes deep. So for me, that's a really interesting combination. In terms of books, one book I liked so much that when I was running a company, uh, running my company, I would actually uh, gift it to some of our C-level clients. Uh, it's called Smart Cuts. It's by Shane Snow, I believe it is. Um, and I've probably read that book three or four times. And the reason I liked it is because even for the most successful or busy entrepreneurs or investors, you always need to take a step back and kind of reevaluate how you're doing things. And for me, that book was basically you know 10 or 11 chapters. It's a pretty quick, easy read that helps you reflect on your strategy in business and in life and if there are more efficient ways to scale or be successful. And, and the connotation of smart cuts is it's not a shortcut, but there are steps you can take to be smarter instead of working harder that you should think through. And so that book I just felt was like very practical for my life. So it was like very business oriented. Mm-hmm. One book that, and this will be my last recommendation, one book that was totally unrelated to my day-to-day and just kind of brought me into a very different world is a book by um, Harvey Cox, I believe is his name. Um, and it's called When Jesus Came to Harvard. And this book is so fascinating because for me, it combines like the intellectual side and journey I've been on and like this religious kind of extra, not extraterrestrial, but certainly like higher being question. And the book basically is uh, a reflection on what were to happen uh, if Jesus were to come and kind of faced with a lot of the questions that we're faced with today and it's written and kind of narrated by this Harvard professor of philosophy and theology. And, and so that is a very different book that I think when I was reading it helped me question my own morality, some of my own decision making, like gives you just a really big picture you know, view on life, but also kind of goes narrow on like very specific things that we struggle with as humans from time to time. And so for just the sake of how different that one is, that one might be interesting for folks to explore as well. That sounds great. I, I love these recommendations. Thanks a lot. Um, and yeah, th- thank, thanks a lot for spending some of your valuable time with me. Um, I really appreciated some of the answers. I like how it's like you sound uh, pretty thoughtful and just in, in, in your answers. And I appreciate that a lot. So thanks for spending some of your time with me and um, going over the questions in the conversation. It was a lot of fun. Well, thanks so much for having me on and thanks for doing the podcast too. I, I will put in a plug for you and others that create content like this. Um, this is a major asset to the industry, um, whether you just graduated college and you're trying to get up to speed on space and you just got a job as a mechanical engineer in space and you don't know much about it, consuming your content, right? Investors listen to this content too, founders and CEOs. So um, a big thanks to you and others like you that are putting this content and spending nights and weekends doing it because I know this is also not your full-time job. This is in addition to everything you have going on. So um, it's much appreciated and um, great to see it continue to grow and and be successful. Thanks. I really do appreciate that. I think uh, it's the same as you, like gotten so much listening out of it, um, but it didn't scratch the full pitch. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much.